Bienvenue à tous. Welcome to Reporters Plus here on France 24. I'm Mark Owen. In this special edition, Saudi Arabia has called lights, camera, action on a cinema boom. Production of films in stunning locations is also opening up the possibility of a lucrative foreign tourist trade. Saudi Arabia has seen more and more multiplex cinemas opening. Young women make up a large proportion of the audience, a sign of a liberalization of the country. Cinema, though, serves another purpose in Saudi Arabia. Activists say it's a cynical front, creating an acceptable face to the hardline actions of Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. So in the foreground, a reformer. But in the background, the action shows if you get the wrong side of him, there's a serious price to pay. A report by Thomas Paga and Mathieu Baudouin. Three young women at the cinema. A casual scene anywhere else in the world. But this is Saudi Arabia. Movies were only authorized here a few years ago. Before that, commercial galleries were the only option for women to go out. Evening entertainment was unthinkable for single people. Today, Safiya, Reem and Salwa are celebrating. Before everyone had to be scared, oh, there is a boy, oh, I cannot go there. But now everything is good, like we can communicate. Yeah, women are getting more comfortable now to go there, like the bare minimum in their lives. So this is really good actually for the cinema. Like this is the first step, maybe it's the first step, yeah. Like baby steps and then we will be more open about our freedom in here, so yeah. Like others in the room, they are constantly using their phones. Saudi Arabia is already hyper-connected, but it's discovering the big screen only now. Yeah, I'm using like everyone. This is my first time here, so I'm really excited. It's the end of a ban unique in the world, which had been enforced for 35 years in this ultra-rigorous monarchy. The decision of one man, Mohammed bin Salman, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. A gesture of openness to the world, coming from a despot, determined to apply shock therapy to his country. 70% of Saudis are younger than 30. Honestly, we won't waste 30 years of our life combating extremist thoughts. We will destroy them now and immediately. But it is also a way to get Saudi Arabia out of its dependence on oil. Cinema alone should bring in more than 20 billion euros by 2030 and encourage tourism in a country that until then was completely closed. When you see a movie and you see an amazing backdrop or you see a, a community or a city, then what do you do? You want to go visit that place. The goal is to transform the image of the country, to make people forget that human rights activists and journalists are still hunted down, imprisoned, or murdered. A country where we will be escorted by employees of the Ministry of the Media throughout our film, where freedom of expression, the right to demonstrate or to criticize the monarchy are non-existent. Can I talk about this? What am I going to... This propaganda operation rests on the shoulders of an all-powerful monarch, who by dint of intimidation ended up concentrating all the powers. He seized power and said, now I'm the boss. And today, he's the sole decider. With our guides, we have an appointment in Jeddah. It's the most cosmopolitan city in the kingdom. On the shores of the Red Sea, the gateway for pilgrims from all over the world to reach the holy sites of Medina and Mecca. Hello. 
In this Western style cafe, a team is installing decor and lighting. We are on a film set. A Saudi production written by Fatima Al Banawi, a successful actress, and for the first time in her career, the director of a feature film. We take all the shots we want for this one. Then we take 61. Pa time passed. Yes, it will be an insert, it will be a pick-up shot on the eye with the skin. Then we have 62. دحين انا بس اعدل الفريم اشوف بالضبط هيقعدوا فين ونعملها اه يلا نروح مع بعض ونيجي هنتكلم I had to make it like five years ago it would have been different difficult very but now I think what I sort of wanted to experience is really to be uh, self ready but also circumstances ready she's part of the golden youth a graduate in psychology at Harvard. A Saudi for whom leading a team is natural. So we focus on each one and we take multiple takes. On the set, languages and nationalities intermingle. Find the spear. There is one hundred. The actors are Saudi. Up, up. The director of photography is Bulgarian. Okay. As for the technicians, they're mostly Lebanese or Egyptian. Ahmed, also uh, called Namlo, as an ant, is not really an ant. <laughs> Very vocal ant. We have our main protagonist over there, my father, playing the role of Dr. Adli. <laughs> we have our coolest third AD, who's a great TikTok creator, I must say, very natural. Her film is inspired by her life. A Saudi expatriate who returns to a changing country, finding her father struck by mental illness in the midst of the COVID crisis. But here, there is no space for criticism of the Saudi system, no questioning of the monarchy nor any overtly feminist message. Hey, but this is all political. Like the way I lead, the way I speak, the way I communicate and whisper to someone instead of doing it in front of everyone, this is politics. So instead of preaching and talking about it, really allowing my work and myself to be what others can learn from. The mere presence of Fatma al-Banawi on the set is a considerable change in a country where five years ago, Women were only tolerated in the public space, where even today, their life is subject to the tutelage of a man. Everything has changed 180 degrees. And I'm a father of daughters, and uh, I'm really happy for them because opportunities are just popping up. And suddenly doors open, and you see all those talents coming. You never saw them before. I think it's the same for men and women. They can both create. They have stories to tell. And I'm happy to be a part of it. Saudi cinema is born again. After a long forced interruption. <coughs> In the 1950s, screenings were organized in the big cities of the kingdom. Many films produced by American oil companies.
we asked one of the pioneers of cinema in Saudi Arabia to delve back into this history. Saleh Fouzan began his career by renting videotapes. He remembers films from his childhood shown in public, like here in the old Jeddah. So this would take place at home. The ladies would sit at the back and the kids in the front. And the theater would be our neighbor's house. Everyone would gather at his house to watch a film. We'd gather on occasions like Eid or on the weekends, Thursday or Friday evenings. It was fairly cheap, so between us, we'd rent a film by chipping in, or if someone was doing well, they would invite us and we would all gather and watch it at their house. Lamec. But everything stopped in 1979. Exasperated by what they denounced as the deprivation of morals in the kingdom, 200 fundamentalists stormed the great mosque of Mecca. En tout cas, au regard de ces images, on s'est battu avec acharnement dans les salles de prière, les couloirs, les minarets autour de l'esplanade de la Kaaba. On s'est battu the siege lasted almost two weeks and caused several hundred casualties. On ignore tout des motivations de ce commando. It left a lasting mark on the royal family. It was a religious dispute with the ultra-conservatives, even more conservative than them, who said to the Saud family, you are bad Muslims. And so they needed to demonstrate that they were good Muslims. And so they closed, cancelled all signs of opening the cinemas, theatres, literature, and a form of religious freedom. It was at this time that Salah Fouzan decided to leave Saudi Arabia. He went to Egypt, then to Lebanon. He rarely returns to his country. I was born into a religious family. And we are known for this, so my involvement with the film and video industry was sinful to them. Religious tensions remain a sensitive subject in Saudi Arabia. And here, we are constantly under surveillance. There were two sides to this story. From the government and official side, the cinema was halal, or okay in other words. But the religious conservatives considered it sinful. I'm not religious, I'm liberal. The agent of the ministry interrupts us and tells Saleh Fouzan that it is better not to mention this painful past. <laughs> the interview ends here, but Saleh Fouzan wants to introduce us to someone. A few steps away, a brand new university welcomes around 10,000 students. And at its head, Dr. Shihab Jamjoum. Look at this doctor, look what you did for us. May God preserve you and everyone like you. It was all thanks to your efforts. He is the first Saudi to have studied cinema in Hollywood. A former classmate of George Lucas. I started at one of the most important universities in California, where many well-known directors and producers graduated from. In Saudi Arabia, it was difficult to work in cinema or the film industry, so I studied television. This university is his pride. In these studios, with state-of-the-art equipment, the 2023 cinema class is being trained. Camera rolling. Action. Uh, Tell us about yourself. Uh, My name is Nawaf Mohammed Bagabas. 
ايش اللي خلاك What made you want to join UBT First thing I heard a lot about it and the people I know who graduated from there work in good positions now For me personally I fell in love with filmmaking and I really strive to be a director in the future hopefully inshallah my dear, can you imagine what we are thinking? As producers and people in the field of cinema since the 60s, Dr. Shahab and myself have had to work in Egypt, Europe, Morocco, and Tunisia. And we're looking at you as a dream come true. Can you imagine that? For this new generation, the internet has long been the only way to connect to the world. The Saudis have taken to this means of expression on YouTube and other networks. Despite censorship. This satirical video dates from 2013. It's reached 17 million views. No, no, I'm not dry. No, I'm not dry. Since cinemas were banned in 1980, a few dozen feature films have still been shot in the country. While visiting Cannes in 2013, Saudi director Haifa al-Mansour explained that she had to hide from the morality police while shooting and talk to her teams on the walkie-talkie. And Saudi Arabia is very segregated, so I have to be in a van. I don't want to clash with the... If it is the norm. People are not, don't expect women to be in the street. Her film Wajda, which won an award in Venice, tells the story of a young girl confronted with the strict rules of a society where women live in complete lockdown. Suddenly, in 2018, everything opened up at the same time. Access to the stadium for women, shows, concerts. Mohammed bin Salman was then 32 years old. He himself was part of this generation eager for leisure. But his calculation is also political. He saw in neighboring Egypt and Tunisia, the Arab Spring push former leaders into exile. He quickly understood that he needed to give air to his country. It's the most connected youth in the world, with the highest number of Facebook or YouTube accounts per inhabitant in the world. And it's also the youth who have the highest obesity rate in the world. So it's as if the youth was connected to the world and locked up at home. This is an absolutely major political risk. And so he overcame this risk by saying to young people, I am on your side. I am on the side of openness. I'm on the side of progress. What he's doing in Arabia is very smart because he's offering them a window to breathe that is not political and that would not push them to political mobilization. But there is also another side to the new Saudi Arabia, much less pleasant. The prince began his reign by harshly repressing those who challenged his policies and, first of all, the religious conservatives. He did not hesitate to imprison those who refused the evolution of society. Has the power. He doesn't. Then he attacked his opponents, such as Jamal Khashoggi, an exiled journalist and fierce critic of the regime. It is becoming a one-man rule. He has a control on everything. He is creating an environment of uh, of, of, of of intimidation and and fear. Saudis are being silenced. Things are not being transparent, and that is not a good recipe for reform in Saudi Arabia. And he needs to do something about that. The last image of Khashoggi has made the headlines. Inside the Saudi Arabian consulate in Istanbul, 
he was tortured, murdered, and then dismembered by the prince's agents. Lina Al-Hathloul is based in Brussels. She is a Saudi human rights activist. Here she can move around without fear of being arrested or questioned by the authorities. In her country, women's rights activists are imprisoned by the dozens. Her own sister, Lujain Al-Hathloul, filmed herself driving when women were still banned from doing so in May 2018. Hello, everyone. My name is Lu Jane Al Hatlul. I'm on the highway. I'm going to try to cross the Saudi borders. Let's see what happens. In prison, she was tortured before being released but banned from leaving the country. Today, the regime finally allows women to drive. But it continues the repression. What's new now is that even people who are unknown, who have no weight, who nobody knows, are also being arrested, imprisoned for decades. So that's the case, for example, after my sister got out of prison, of a woman called Salma al shehab She was sentenced to 34 years in prison for having retweeted me. That was in a tweet where I was talking about my sister. So actually, talking about my sister is a crime in itself now. This is not an exception. We also have Nora al kahtani who was sentenced to 45 years just for a few tweets. From the Belgian capital, Lina al Hathloul can watch the latest features of Saudi cinema, but she knows that this opening is a way to give the regime a modern, respectable image. She deplores the silence of artists, directors, even though they now have a global audience. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to criticize people who now have open doors. But in the end, it's true that when you participate in this kind of event without being able to speak, without being able to criticize, without even being able to question, you're definitely part of a campaign which is bigger than yourself. A campaign to promote the regime? Yes, to promote the regime, yes. Despite these challenges, film professionals around the world have not resisted the lure of petrodollars. The Saudi market arouses appetite. The population is young, rich, ready to pay more than $20 for a ticket. And this man is determined to take advantage of it. Faisal Baltior distributes most of the country's films in these new monumental multiplexes. He wants to show us this room and its grandiose colonnades in the heart of Jeddah. He knows it. Here, the potential of cinema is infinite. Today, we have 500 screens, uh, which being built within only four, uh, four years, that is taking the major, we can say almost 40, 45% of the whole box office in the Middle East. This is just in case A. The plan is to reach 2,000 screens. For the second time last December, Jeddah hosted the International Red Sea Film Festival. On the red carpet, glamorous dresses and ceremonial smiles. Faisal Baltior and his team did not shun their pleasure. The possibilities are now endless. He can work in his country for the sound. We cannot make commercial films, okay, where it will go. 
So that's why we were making films, going, traveling the world in the biggest film festival, but we cannot screen it in KSA, in our country. At his side, Sharon Stone, Melanie Laurent, Jackie Chan, Charlotte Gainsbourg, and Antonio Bandera. The festival jury was chaired by Oliver Stone. But I think people who judge too harshly should come and visit this place and see it for themselves, because there was a lot to see. Under the finery of the festival hotel, we followed in Daniel Ziskin's footsteps. Hello? A French producer specialized in Arab films. Hey, ça va? Et toi? Très, très bien. Je suis content de te voir. Oui, moi aussi. Hello. In this small world, Tiens, voilà, Mohamed Diab. he always has a colleague. Deux films à Cannes, un film à Venise et une série Marvel Disney. Or a friend to greet. You know we have a film tonight. Uh, yeah, uh, which one? Hanging Gardens. He even planned a little something for the patron of the festival. Hello. Yeah, hello. hello. Um, nice to meet you. I'm looking for Mr. Abdullah. Yeah. I have this for him, but if I can give him... This box of chocolates, a small token of affection for someone who can open so many doors. As long as he has it, he has it, which it's the most important thing, but he's not around. He's not around yet, no. No, no. Of course you have to come here. It's the same debate as people who love football and didn't go to see the World Cup in Qatar. Why did they wake up at the last moment? He is looking for funding. European productions lack money, and according to him, the Saudis are serious businessmen, lovers of cinema, and are anxious to invest smartly. The economic conditions are like with any other partner. They want their return on investment, for sure. Easy money in the Arab world is a mirage, it doesn't exist. Of course, there are nice facilities, you're well received, but when it comes to actually shooting films, it's all about business. In the producer's hall, France even has its own pavilion. The country trains young Saudi filmmakers and facilitates networking. Charles-Henri Gros is cultural attaché at the consulate. For him, there is no taboo. This country is opening up at high speed, and France must support the move. The record in terms of human rights of the country, is that something France is comfortable with? You're asking me about the subject of cinema. I'll remain on the question of cinema. The featured offering, which is also in theaters in town, has zero censorship. This festival is a parenthesis in a country where freedom of expression is limited. On the opening day, the organizers highlighted the blue kaftan by Moroccan Mariam Tuzani, which openly touches on homosexuality. Broadcasted only once, it will not be commercially distributed in the kingdom. For films aimed at the general public, censorship or bans are common. Some cartoons, for example, have been banned for depicting same-sex couples or nudity scenes. The state channel Al Akbaria raised concerns about certain scenes, blurred when on air, and denounced the subversive influence of Western values. Yes, we can have a festival where there are international stars who come dressed like they do at the Cannes Film Festival, where there are global films which could be shown at any other festival. The real subject is will they be broadcast in Arabia? And to what extent, I think that films with a political connotation will never be broadcast in Arabia. Will there be censorship? No, we don't even need censorship. The film won't even reach the cinema. He won't find a distributor. The key man in Saudi cinema is Abdullah Alayev, chairman of the Film Commission. To finance the sector, he has an almost unlimited budget. He is an engineer and an award-winning director. To him, Western critics make no sense. He welcomes a cinema in accordance with Saudi values and rejects any idea of propaganda. There will always be misconceptions about a country like Saudi Arabia. 
before, it was accused of not having a film industry and that the government wouldn't support filmmakers. Now we have the support, we have the industry, and we are accused of using it to whitewash our image. This is hypocritical. It's our right to tell our stories and to do it through cinema, which should always be seen as one of the most beautiful forms of art. Developing the cinema industry doesn't only serve to show a less controversial image to Westerners. How long will the Saudis be able to benefit from their oil revenues? Black gold creates few jobs and maintains severe inequalities. The richest are exempted from working, the others suffer from high unemployment. A two-tier economy in an omnipotent state, which the prince wants to reform. And that means training. It means working in the private sector rather than the public. It means work more to earn more. If they want to improve their socio-economic status, they just have to work. And not for the state, but rather in the private sector. The kingdom has set up a plan. Vision 2030. Displayed everywhere next to the faces of the prince and King Salman, his father a budget of $1,000 billion to transform the economy. Investment in tourism, new technologies and gigantic projects like NEON. A blockbuster trailer for a futuristic city designed by special effects experts. The line will be built in the middle of the desert, a single building 170 kilometers long and 500 meters high, with dubious ecological promises. With no need for cars, resulting in zero carbon emissions. Neom should come out of the ground in barely seven years. And the cinema already has its place there. A few studios and these bungalows in the sand. The regime wants to attract film crews from all over the world to this desert. Saudi Arabia promises to pay 40% of the budget of each shooting without taxes. Neom will be a kingdom within the kingdom, with its own laws different from the rest of the country. The communication operation is carried out by foreign consultants, recruited at great expense. Watch out. <laughs> Very good. That's impressive. That. <laughs> Watch out. The Australian Wayne Borg came to the Jeddah Festival to praise the latest equipment from Neon. Our in-state media hub will be a million square metres. We'll have between 45 and 50 sound stages, tenancy space, gaming studios, industry learning facilities, as well as incubation and startup space. It'll be the world's first truly integrated media hub. But beyond the PR, impossible to know more. Tell us more about this semi-autonomous status and what it entails. Well, that'll be... Can I talk about this? Yeah, you can talk about the laws and regulations and can't give specifics. Yeah, so... Uh, they're coming a little bit later on. So, NEOM will have uh, its own founding laws and regulations so that we're able to compete to attract the world's best talent and industry, you know, to further the ambitions we have of creating a real sort of powerhouse and dynamic economic and, uh, and social centre. The talking points are nebulous, but the calculation is simple. Welcoming film crews to work in Neom means injecting millions of dollars into the local economy. Diversifying also means encouraging tourism. Welcome to Al Ala. the southern border of the ancient Nabataean kingdom 2,000 years ago. The route of caravans, which transported their spices to the Mediterranean. Few foreign travelers have ever explored these mountains. But the country has been granting tourist visas since 2019. Here in 
really doing, as you see, the roof high to support the ecosystem. When we are stand here and I talk, I know all the people in this way, you can hear me. So, These tombs were until now considered a vestige of the time of ignorance before Islam. Today, hundreds of local English-speaking guides have been trained, such as Mashail Alanzi. She's been here since the beginning, four years ago. So behind the Diwan, we have the Basij Asir. So if you don't mind, we can go to the close to see the God. The inscription here mentions there is none come from the Busra. Before the government is coming here, it's opening actually, but uh, without uh, organizer, without uh, anything, without guide, without uh, rangers, without uh, anything. I brought because I'm, I'm from here, I'm from Al Ula. I born in here actually. I remember all the sites here, then I will explain that as a uh, uh, girl from Al Ula. Yeah. The goal is to create one million jobs to welcome 100 million visitors by 2030. The state intends to use cinema to change the image of the country, and obviously for the Spanish tourists. Look how beautiful it is. It's super pretty, huh? The formula works. These tombs, they look like they're in Indonesia. <laughs> how did you find out about Saudi Arabia? Movies and Instagram. And what movies? those that talk about the country, it's really something I find interesting. When I say I'm going to Saudi Arabia, everyone tells me, what? Human rights, all that. But I answer them that it's false, that it's got nothing to do with what we see on the internet, for example. The Saudis have understood the power of cinema and image. So they called in a pro. Philip Jones came straight from Texas. He's in charge of accommodation in Al Ola. Okay, okay, great. great. You can see, you know, this is all relatively new, and we're really trying to make sure it's preserved and protected in a setting that is so amazing. He insisted on giving us a tour of film camp a hotel specially designed to accommodate film crews. Of late, there's been more and more requests. Phase one is 150 rooms. Phase two will be another 150 rooms uh, for a total of 300. It's all within 20 minutes of most of the amazing natural beauty for, for film crews to shoot. And we are also building two sound stages as phase one that's about 20 minutes away, just south of here. The technicians of several American blockbusters, as well as the first Saudi feature film shot on site, were hosted here. Film is an extension of the tourism sort of infrastructure and positioning of the destination. It helps build brand awareness. And the more people who are exposed to the natural beauty of this area and, and the uniqueness of it, the more people I think will want to come and visit this amazing place. back to the cinema in Jeddah. At the end of the first session of their lives, we meet up again with the three young women, Sawa, Safiya and Reem. They were moved by the story of a South Korean dancer with a tragic destiny. Yeah, I'm still looking. It's full of tears. It's a good movie, actually. It's to raise awareness and stuff, and I really like it. It's the first time that I see a movie like this. I usually watch, like, comedy and action, but this is really good. A controlled openness. A diversified economy. freedom to create, albeit without criticizing. This is the social project that the Crown Prince has imposed by force. But will this new possibility survive in the long run? Uh, 
At some point, people develop the concept of entitlement, of what they have. It's not a privilege one has just acquired. It's a right, it's part of everyday life. But we have already seen societies turn completely in the opposite direction, with the use of a lot of violence and repression. And so that remains to be seen. But if you ask me, there, in the short term, are there any changes or reforms that can be considered? Yes, it's possible. Because it depends on just one person. Despite its uncertain future, the opening of cinemas is a showcase of today's Saudi Arabia. Time will tell how the youth of the country uses this window to the world, and if it will bring about other changes in the country. Lifting the Veil on Saudi Cinema, a film by Thomas Paga and Mathieu Baudouin. You can see it again, of course, on our website, france24.com. This is Reporters Plus. Stay with us, most of all. Stay safe. <laughs>